Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Logos Poetry Collective. My name is Travis Helms, and I'm joined tonight by Jason Myers, my co-officiant and co-MC. I'm an Episcopal priest at the University of Texas campus here in Austin. Jason is executive director of Ecotheo Review, and along with Blue Flower Arts, we are very blessed and privileged to present this special gathering with Camille T. Dungy and Amy Nezokumatato. Thank you so much for joining us. We're also streaming this broadcast to Facebook Live. Um, you're gonna have some instructions appear in your chat at various points throughout the evening, which will give you a bit of an orientation as to how Logos gatherings are organized. This entire format was the genesis of a conversation that happened a couple years ago with a dear friend of mine. Two years ago, I was having a conversation with a local poet, and we were talking about how so many poetry gatherings can feel transactional in some sense. That you're either passively sitting in the audience absorbing poetry or you're discharging it on people from the podium. We started talking about ritual and about liturgy and about ways to incorporate a little bit of ritual into the way we gather for a poetry reading to create something more participatory and dynamic. So we call these liturgically inflected reading experiences by artfully incorporating a little bit of ritual into the way we gather we try to evoke transcendence through poetry, ritual, and conversation. And what we'd like to do now is just give you a sense of how that format progresses over the course of the next hour. So following this word of welcome, we are going to ask you to join us in the recitation of a poem. This will be a collaborative reading, the way that you might read a psalm in, in a church service. Following that responsive reading, each of our poets are going to read a short set of poetry, and the final poem that they read is going to be printed here on the screen in front of you. Following those poetry readings, we're going to have a bit of curated conversation with our poets, and typically we're gathered in a beautiful brewery called Lazarus Brewing Company in East Austin, and our nights conclude with a festal conversation when we have a chance to discuss these poets' work over tacos and queso and other libations. But in lieu of that this evening, we're just gonna have a little bit of a chance to feast on some conversation with our poets. They've graciously offered to stay on our call for a couple minutes, for five or 10 minutes following the formal program to answer some questions in a Q&A. So our program is bookended by an opening text and a closing text. And each one is offered as a sort of invocation and a benediction so that we can all offer our voices collectively into the celebratory space. So in just a moment, we're going to bring up our opening text, and you'll see that there's a bit of regular text, and then portions of that text are bolded. So we invite you to read those bolded texts along with us, to add your voice to this collective. So if you would, because Zoom doesn't do a good job picking up multiple microphone sources, simply keep your microphone muted, but feel free to speak those lines aloud into the space around you. So what we'll do now is take a moment to ground and center ourselves in the space. And then after just a couple moments of silence, our featured poets are going to lead us in that opening responsive reading of our benediction text, which is Generations by Lucille Clifton. Generations. People who are going to be. In a few years. Bottoms of trees. Bear responsibility to something. Besides people. If it was only. You and me. Sharing the consequences. It would be different. It would be just. Generations of men. But. This business of war. These, these war kinds of things. Are erasing those natural obedient generations. Who ignored pride. Stood on no hind legs. Begged no water. Stole no bread. 
did their own things. And the generations of rice, of coal, of grasshoppers, by their invisibility, denounce us. Thank you, Amy and Camille, for that beautiful recitation. And now I have the tremendous pleasure and honor of introducing our first poet. Fennel blackberry, mustard plum. I point these out on our walks, writes Camille T. Dungy, addressing her daughter Callie in an essay from Guidebook to Relative Strangers, Journeys into Race, Motherhood, and History, a National Book Critics Circle Award finalist. We can eat them if we need to, I say, as if naming what could save us might save us one day. Dungy is a poet of vision, not in a European high romantic sense, which can amount to a kind of transcendental escapism, but in a much more vital way. She attends to what is really there, speaks each creature's name. Gray wolf, deer fawn, Fox Elder, Sequoia Simperverens. To journey with Dungy through her four collections of poetry, especially her most recent, Trophic Cascade, winner of the Colorado Book Award, is to be entrusted to the strength of a guide who knows not just how to name, keep safe, but also how best to move through our human and non-human ecologies. And their tenuous fecundity and glorious threatened flux in order to bear more life. As editor of celebrated anthologies, Black Nature, Four Centuries of African American Nature Poetry, and From the Fish House, Dungy cultivates space and asks us to revision the notions of literary tradition and convention we've received. A 2019 Guggenheim Fellow, Dungy has received NEA fellowships in poetry and prose an American Book Award, two NAACP Image Award nominations, and two Hurston Wright Legacy Award nominations, and is University Distinguished Professor at Colorado State University. Her guidebook concludes with an essay that recounts a trip to Cape Coast Castle in Ghana, where she relates 1,500 old world Africans at a time were converted into new world slaves, month after month, year after year, for more than 150 years. Callie, the indomitable exuberant muse of this collection is behaving as one might expect an almost three-year-old to behave and inclined to play. Navigating, as in so much of her writing, the complex interrelated matrices of identity, history, and family, Dungy says to her daughter, shh, this is a sacred space, be still. Such writing names the sacred in our realities, the realities of motherhood and mother nature that may in some sense save us. And we are generously invited in so that we might listen and see a bit more clearly. We are blessed by this gift of vision and to welcome to Logos this evening, Camille T. Dungy. Thank you so much, Travis. That was wonderful to hear. Um, I'm just gonna start. One night in 1888, as the French steamboat Abdel Qadir powered from Marseille to Algiers. News reports proclaim the sky became quite black with swallows. The channel between one life and another has always been subject to sudden explosions. Those swallows must have been exhausted. The birds alighted in the thousands on the sails, ropes, and yards of the Abdel Qadir. I begin with birds, thousands. Some wandered into cabins, ate from passengers' delighted hands. I will return to the birds, but you should know the Abdel Qadir was named 
for a man who died five years before they blacked the sky around the boat that bore his name. If you don't know how many died, how many he saved in the decades of conflict between France and Algiers while Abdel Qadir was a mere, maybe you won't know what a wonder this was to report. I read about it in the New York Times. This must have sounded in those days like the stories we hear now of cranes, white napped, red capped, who nest nowhere securely but along Korea's demilitarized zone. Those winged strangers remained all night on the vessel, the article claims. In the morning, fed and rested, they flew off for coastal islands still controlled by Spain, which, as you know, once kept as its own our neighbors, Honduras, El Salvador, Mexico. I've been trying to write about the Abdel Qadir swallows for more years than I am able to count. Yesterday, you apologized for arriving late for dinner. You'd seen a small bent woman walking with heavy bags near the grocery store and you stopped to ask if she would let you drive her home. You are the size of black man people here consider frightening. The woman must have been exhausted. She settled her body in the cabin and you carried her safely home. Some days, especially as I am reminded of how we fight the animals we are, who need to migrate as much as we need to settle, to stay, how we'll tear apart and strand and starve and slaughter that part of us who takes flight from one place to some other. I try to recreate this. A rather curious episode in natural history occurred the other day. The story I love so much begins. I love reading that poem in the presence of Amy because um, she really is the initiating factor that took that um, idea from what was actually 17 years of thinking about the Abdel Qadir Swallows to um, four hours of writing it because Amy asked for it. Um, she just needed a poem right then that day. And so what I call that is a 17 year and four hour poem. Um, but so much of what we do as writers, as poets, um, is to work in that kind of communication. I'm talking with a, a newspaper article from 1888. I'm talking with Amy. I'm talking with my husband and with all these other um, people. And I think we feel so isolated sometimes now in our current condition. And I thought I would read a poem that speaks directly both to that sense of isolation and frustration and um, um, the frustration and like a blockage and also the potential that is available. So this next poem is a, a jokey uh, response poem to um, William Carlos Williams. And I'm reading it particularly for those uh, parents um, and mothers and caregivers who are trying to balance being artistic beings in this time at the same time that we're also having to be parents. Ars Poetica after William Carlos Williams. If when my hubby is sleeping and the baby and Vanessa are sleeping and the sun is a yellow gray frisbee in nets of fog caught in burled trees. If I in my kitchen wrote poems unceasingly at my table twirling my hair round my finger and whispering softly to my old self. I am awake now, awake. I have always been awake. It is just so. If I admire my fingers, their grip, the muscle in my arms, breast full with uncried for milk, who am I to say I am not 
the fortunate creator of my household. I just have two more poems, one more relatively new one, and, um, and then our final poem from Trophic Cascade. To, em to enter our own empty house. She was seven when we stopped using keys. One less thing to lose. Now we punch a combination, easy, but hopefully not so easy a stranger could guess. This is where I should stop. They are bound to be angry, my beloveds. I am giving away all our secrets again. Such vulnerability is the root of much fury. I was small. One stone in our yard hit a metal case with a lid that slid like a match top box to reveal our key. Lifting that brown rock, I'd think hard of bashing someone's head. Harm always comes dressed in the body of a stranger. Sometimes I wrestle with my daughter, make her tiny body work its way out from under the weight I make of my own. In this way, I try to teach her how it feels to break free. And now for my final poem. Thank you everybody for being part of this online adventure of community and language and poetry. And I know there are many, many things that we could all be doing with our time. And so I value um, that you've all decided to spend this hour with us. I hope that what we give you is feeding you. Characteristics of life. A fifth of animals without backbones could be at risk of extinction, say scientists. BBC Nature News. Ask me if I speak for the snail, and I will tell you, I speak for the snail. I speak of underneathedness and the welcome of mosses, of life that springs up, little lives that pull back and wait for a moment. I speak for the damselfly, water skeet, mollusk, the caterpillar, the beetle, the spider, the ant. I speak from the time before spinelessness was frowned upon. Ask me if I speak for the moon jelly. I will tell you one thing today and another tomorrow. And I will be as consistent as anything alive on this earth. I move as the currents move with the breezes. What part of your nature drives you? You in your cubicle ought to understand me. I filter and filter and filter all day. Ask me if I speak for the Nautilus and I will be silent as the Nautilus shell on a shelf. I can be beautiful and useless if that's all you know to ask of me. Ask me what I know of longing and I will speak of distances between meadows of night blooming flowers. I will speak the impossible hope of the firefly. You with a candle burning and only one chair at your table must understand such wordless desire. To say it is mindless is missing the point. Thank you so much, Camille. Uh, it certainly fed me, and I hope that it, it I, I'm sure that it is feeding all of you out there in Zoom land and Facebook land. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our second poet this evening. How I love 
the grab and pull for something you can't name, only knowing you want more. So says Amy Mizuka Matato in Cheese Curds, the first time, a poem from her first full-length collection, Miracle Fruit. Indeed, her poems grab and pull us, and while they satisfy us with the richness of their music and a radiant registry of sensuous details, they also leave us craving more. Her poems are filled to the brim with so much wing, fur, and fin, as you'll find in her most recent collection, Oceanic. That word might name not just her book, but Mizuku Matatil's poetics. Again and again in her poems, we find not just individual stars of the ocean, such as the starfish that graces the book's cover, but qualities of an ocean, capacity, vivacity, mystery. I've learned it's okay to glance down once in a while into the sea, she offers an invitation, calling to mind Thoreau's observation that heaven is below our feet as well as above our heads. If, as Simone Weil wrote, absolutely unmixed attention is prayer, and as Mary Oliver wrote, attention is the beginning of devotion, then Nezuku Matadil's poems are required devotional texts in which we encounter water prayer, rising like a host of paper lanterns and discover the fields of soybean and mice became a kind of prayer. In her four collections of poems, as well as her forthcoming book of essays, World of Wonders, Izuku Matadil sings songs of praise and lament, blessing the sweet and crying out at the bitter, hymning the glorious and that which threatens its diminution. To read her work is to find ourselves, as a speaker at the end of one poem puts it, the amazed staring back at the amazed. Friends, please welcome Amy Mizuku Matata. Thank you all so, so much. Um, I'm gonna start, let me see. Um, okay, great. For a second, everybody turn little black squares. Um, I'm gonna read two poems and in between that, I'm gonna do a little excerpt of like, um, of one of the essays that's coming out in Ika Theo. So, all right, I'm gonna start out with this poem. Um, called Chess. Camille, it's so great to be able to be with you. I said there in the chat, I don't know if you could see that, I teach that last poem of yours all the time. So I'm so glad, and I did not know you were going to be reading that last, so that was a nice little segue, but now I want to just be thinking of the mollusks and stuff like that. So anyway, anyway, um, I'm going to read a love poem, and it's called Chess. Exactly four different men have tried to teach me how to play. I can never tell the difference between a rook and bishop, but I knew the horse meant knight. And that made sense to me because a horse is knight. Soot, hoof, and nostril, dark as a sabled evening with no stars, bats, or moon blooms. It's a night in Ohio where a man sleeps alone one week and the next, the woman he will eventually marry leans her body into his for the first time. Leans a kind of faith too, filled with white crickets and bouquets of wild carrot. And the months and the honeyed years after that will make all the light and dark squares feel like tiles for a kitchen they can one day build together. Every turn, every sacrificial move, all the decoys, the castling, the deflections, these will be riotous and unruly, the exact opposite of what she ever thought she wanted in the end game of her days. All right, I'm gonna read a little selection. Um, 
it's coming out in the next issue. Is that right, Jason? The next issue of Ecotheo. Um, and it's called Dancing Frog. Um, I have a little collection of nature essays coming out. It's called World of Wonders. And um, they're illustrated. And this is what the little dancing frogs look like. And I wanted to, I chose this because I'm just going to read a little section of it. I chose this because, um, you know, you hear all these things of extinctions, frankly, and this happened not too long ago where there was um, a bunch of frogs that were discovered. So instead of um, being extinct, this was kind of just breaking news for all the frog scientists, and it just so happened to be in Kerala, um, where my dad is from. So um, this is just an excerpt from Dancing Frog. It must be summertime, the season of outdoor dance parties and cookouts, because I cannot get enough of dancing. Oh my gosh. Just can I just say real quick, reading this, that's the first time I've read it since I've been indoors. <laughs> and so no, there are no outdoor dance parties and cookouts. I mean, among with our friends. Oh my gosh, this just is gonna send me. This is supposed to be cheerful. Now it's okay. Let me start that over. Hang on. It must be summertime, the season of outdoor dance parties and cookouts, because I cannot get enough of dancing. More specifically, dancing animals. And I'm not the only one either. Recently, the, re the reptile and amphibian world was rocked by the discovery of a record 14 new species of frog. Herpetologists first broke the news in Kerala, the state in southern India where my father's from. This region is a biodiversity hotspot, meaning many of its flora and fauna aren't found anywhere else in the world. All 14 of the new frogs belong to the genus Myxocralis, and herpetologists have named them simply dancing frogs. When I say this, perhaps you might think of the delightfully named Michigan J frog from the old Looney Tunes cartoons. You know that one, Michigan J wore a top hat and carried a cane and he sang, hello my baby, and only danced when people were not watching. And boy, did he ever dance, kicking that leg out with more vim and vigor than any can-can girl. Only male dancing frogs like Michigan J exhibit this unusual behavior though. The larger the frog, the more frequently they dance. It's a way of courting, and it's also a defense of, hey, stand back, this lady is spoken for, which is needed on the jungle's dance floor, where 50 males often outnumber females, I'm sorry, where males often outnumber females 100 to 1. A frog begins by taking his place on top of a lone wet rock near a cold, cold stream and stretching back one leg at a time. When the leg is fully extended, he spreads his toes as wide as possible, like opening an umbrella with the webbing be between each toe stretched as far as it can go. A semaphore to tell the other male frogs, go away, but at the same time says to females, hey, come join the party. All right, I'm gonna stop there. Um, and then I'm gonna switch on, this is my last poem, and this is called, um, Summer Hiboon. I want to wait just a second here. All right. Summer Hiboon. This, um, the Hiboon form is one of my favorite, it is my actual favorite form of poetry. Um, and I love that it's what I call kind of a chicken bullion cube of concentrated imagery, and then it ends in a haiku. So, um, it's usually for travel writing, but I kind of adopted it to just place writing as well. And this is Summer Haibun. To everything, there is a season of parrots. Instead of feathers, we search the sky for meteors on our last night. Salamanders use the star to find their way home. Who knew they could see that far, fix the tiny beads of their eyes on distant arrangements of lights, so as to return to wet and wild nests. Our heads tilt up and up and we are careful not to look at each other. You were born on a day of peaches splitting from so much rain and the slick smell of fresh tar and asphalt push, pushed over a cracked parking lot. You were strong enough, even as a baby, to clutch a fistful of thistle and the sun himself 
was proud to light up your teeth when they first swelled and pushed up from your gums. And this is how I will always remember you when we are covered up again by the pale mica flecks on your shoulders. Some thrown there from your own smile, some from my own teeth. There are not enough jam jars to can the summer sky at night. I want to spread those little meteors on a hunk of still warm bread this winter. Any trace left on the knife will make a kitchen sink like that evening air, the cool night before star showers. So sticky, so warm, so full of light. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you both. Um, both of your sets of poems were, were full of light and uh, we're delighted to have you both with us this evening and delighted to be joined by so many of you out there. Ordinarily, this would be when we would sort of transition into a time for conversation among ourselves. And usually we gather at Lazarus Brewery in East Austin and we would be dancing and we would be drinking and eating and, and talking about poetry. And so, you know, instead of that, we're, we're, all, we're all here together. Together. And these would ordinarily be the questions that we would invite you to consider as you're reflecting on the poems that you've just heard, and you would have a printed order of service with those poems to take with you, which you do actually have the, the program available to you as a PDF in the, in the chat. So we hope that you will take the poems from this evening, both Amy's and Camille's as well as Lucille's and, and our final poem that we'll hear this evening by Rita Dub with you. And of course, we invite you to apply these, these questions if they seem uh, to stir anything for you, to bring your own questions, of course. But since we're not at Lazarus, we are going to just have a little bit of conversation now with, with Amy and Camille and then conclude the formal part of our program. And then hopefully we'll have a, a little bit of time after that they have agreed to, to briefly linger and maybe answer a question or two from you all. So. With that said, we're now turning to an opportunity to hear a little bit more and engage. So as I was reading through your work over the last couple of weeks, a word that stood out to me in both of your works was home, particularly from Oceanic in, in your poem from the Rambutan Notebooks. You write, I have been studying the word home as if studying for a quiz trying to guess answers to questions before they are asked. And then in Guidebook to Relative Strangers, Camille, you have a wonderful essay called Writing Home, where you write that home is not a place. I am thinking perhaps home is not a language either. Language is too easy to lose. Perhaps home is memory. You know, so then I was thinking about the, you know, the Greek word for, for home, oikos, that we get our words, economy and, and ecology from. So I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about the sense of home and, and when you know that you're at home with a particular piece of, of writing and what, what helps you to feel that sense of, of home. Camille, do you want to go first or do you want me? It's fun. Okay. Um, I love that question. Oh my goodness, that's a, that's almost an essay's worth of of, uh, of answers there, Travis. But I think I'll I'll answer first. I mean, I um I moved around a lot when I was little, so I think that idea of home has been so nebulous for me, you know. And what I've learned is um is that home isn't necessarily in a place. I've had to kind of do that for survival, but it's with people. So. Um, you know, my, my first family, my parents are home to me. And then also my husband is home to me. So um, I know that's kind of eyeball and rolling inducing, but it's true. So, I mean, we, we lived in kind of the middle of nowhere, Western New York, and um, we survived frankly, because we had each other. Um, and that I, I would not have lasted 15 years there in that cesspool of racism and, and, and yuck without him. Um, so, but I will also say that um, there are places that make me feel home. And I will say, you know, if you would ask me this even five years ago, um, that I've 
that I'd feel so home in Oxford, Mississippi, I would just be, I think, surprised. But I will tell you here in the South, um, nobody asks, what are you? You know what I mean? Nobody, um, it, it's very complicated, of course. It is, you know, it, it's not this Pollyanna kind of place here, but I will say that there is um, a sense of belonging here in Mississippi that I've never had anywhere else. And um, it's a, it, so that's a bonus. Um, but really, I, I've, I've had to just by default, had to make home where I land, you know. Um, and thankfully, I have my husband by my side with that. But, um, but yeah, and I, and I also wanted to say that in terms of writing, where I feel home in my writing is, um, you know, lately it's been in the essays, you know, and I know this is a poetry show, so I'm, I'm always going to be a poet. I want to, I want to say that I'm not, I'm not defecting over to the essay side, to the prose side. But I think lately something, I think I can tell you since 2016, um, the, the line break felt like tyranny to me. I did not want to listen to the line break anymore. And what I wanted to write about felt constricted once I had to break a line. So I just call it coincidence. I don't know, but I know it happened around 2016 for me. And to me, the essay is a place where I could be more expansive for home. I guess. Camille, how about you? So much of what you say, as usual, resonates with my thinking mm -hmm. on some of these questions. And um, I, I'm, I'm a child of the American West. So I, I grew up in California, um, I live in Colorado. These kind of um, desert, semi-desert arid landscapes um, are, are beautiful to me. I, I like the brown. <laughs> I like the brown in the hills and I like the scrappiness um, and I like the not humid air. Um, so that's one sense of home, that there's, there's, there's a landscape that feels at home to me, that feels welcoming to me, that I feel is a kind of magnetic center for me. Um, and yes, as Amy says, my family, those, those friends, with whom I can just be. Um, those are also places of home. But I think it's really important to point out that there is a lot about these places that I call home where I'm never gonna be able to be fully at home. I'm never going to be able to, unless this country has some sort of mag magnificent revolutionary shift, I'm never going to be allowed to be fully comfortable and fully confident moving out in the world, nor am I able to ever feel fully confident in my Black husband moving out in this world. And so that's part of being at home for me in America is always being slightly uncomfortable, always being slightly um, an outsider or slightly um, in jeopardy in some ways. So if we wanna circle back to how that relates to poetry, I actually kind of think um, that what that means is that in my poems and on the page, I don't expect a kind of easy comfort in what it is that I complete on the page. I don't expect that the poem is complete or the essay is complete when everything closes down and the locked box is secure and safe. I think it's actually a, a true representation of where I live and how I live. There's always some kinds of tension and some kinds of danger um, that live in the work. And that feels like an accurate representation um, of my life and, um, and, and how I live and where I live. And so, yes, there are definitely aspects of home that are safe and beautiful and wonderful and comfortable and um, full of positive nostalgia, but that's not all. Um, and I don't think that it would be an accurate representation of probably most people's worlds to try and say that it, that is all and certainly not my world. You know, Camille, I had a, a question sort of uh, summon itself to mind for me reading your work in, in preparation for this event. And it's, it's a question that I think actually dovetails pretty beautifully with Jason's. And, and I, was, I was struck in, in, I think, some interviews and maybe some things you wrote, Camille, talking about a sense of communion you have with history and the sense in which, in some sense, 
history, whether that's inherited history, familiar history, or a collective cultural history, comes to some sort of a culmination in you and in your personality, the personality you bring to the page. So my question was also about how you navigate that in form, and in particular, how you navigate the history and heritage of form that's sort of received canonically, and how you critique that, engage it, and bring your whole person and, and that culmination of history to that negotiation. Thanks for that question. Thank you to both of you two, Travis and Jason, and also Caleb back there and the, and the um, secret tech side for the work that you guys have done to make this series happen. And this evening, it's just, it's a beautiful, thoughtful um, engagement with the word. I think that you know, there is no there is no such thing as a as like a past really. I mean, one of the ways that I'm try to get people to think about some of the some of the racialized tension that's happening in this country right now. The the little girls who died in the Birmingham church bombing um, would be six, 67 and seventy this year. I mean, that's not old. That's not, they're not old. Right. Um, and so like the, I have colleagues who are still working with me who aren't retired yet, who are in that age range. Right. This is not history. This is people's lives right now that we're living. And when we try to relegate something to the past and that's over, we cannot heal. We cannot grapple with the realities of the world that we have um, that we are living in in the present. Um, and so, yes, I think on the page, one of the things that I'm always trying to do is have a, have a living present time conversation with, with the past and with where it, how I have gotten to where I am now. And as I write more um, in conversation with my, my daughter, I'm also how that past comes through the present and creates a future, uh, which is always in a sort of cyclical conversation. And so going back to that question about form, I think form, it, it becomes a really, you know, a fun way, honestly, to deal with this because these are received forms so frequently, but we have to shift them and change them to allow them to fit our idioms, to allow them to fit languages we know it, to allow them to fit our bodies, right? There's so many bodies of people writing today who were not um, given the space to write, the time to write, the publishing platforms to do that. Um, and so as those voices are coming onto the page, all of the, the existing molds are not going to be sufficient. But that doesn't mean that they're completely insufficient, right? It's this kind of play between figuring out what, what it is that I've received that I can use and what I need to move forward. And so an analogy I might take is that I moved into this house that was in this land, this, this, this Colorado soil, which is its own thing and has been its own thing for a very long time. Anybody else who's built on this house has had to deal with that soil and that's not changing, right? And then I moved in after another family had lived there for a long time and I don't agree with most of their landscaping choices, but I do like some of them, right? And so I'm working around what's existing. I'm not pulling out trees in order to plant what I'm planting. I'm building what I, it is around what's already existing. That's what we do with form too. And that's what we do with history, I think. We take the, the soil that's already been there. We take what the people who have lived in these homes before us have done and then we build it to suit our own tastes and our own needs um, both my own aesthetics and also like I want less water use I want you know like some practical kinds of things like that this is this is what we do on the page every day as writers I love that I, I, I thank you for that gorgeous and incredibly thought-provoking response. And I'm wondering, Amy, if you would care to reflect on that question too, the way you engage your, your personal and collective history with this occupation of, of navigating um, inherited forms as well. Yeah, you know, I think, um, gosh, there's so much, again, of 
to what um, Camille says that I co-sign. And in some ways, Camille, it's no fun because I can't argue, you know, I, there's nothing I'm arguing with, you know, in some ways. I like being able to push against like, mm, have you considered, you know? Um, so I co-sign everything that Camille would say. And I would just kind of throw back um, a little bit to what Camille was saying in terms of um, the aspect of who gets to speak about what subject, you know, um, that kind of thing and, and acknowledging that, but also acknowledging when you have a chance to have, I hate that word platform, but when you have a chance to um, write and be heard, um, you know, finding that balance of acknowledging that. Like, so for example, um, I teach environmental literature and um, only I would, and I've been teaching for 20 years, only I would say recently, thank you, thanks to Camille, and it's been there. It's not that it's only just coming in new, but Camille had gathered this bouquet of flowers into this incredible anthology. Whereas before I would be piecemealing 